Medical Society. Welcome to this news briefing from ACS's 256th National Meeting and Exposition in Boston. We're joined today by Dr. Romel Dator and Dr. Sylvia Balbo from the University of Minnesota. They're studying how e-cigarettes can damage DNA. Dr. Dator? Good morning. Um, so our work uh, at a Masonic Cancer Center in Sylvia Balbo's lab is uh, developing high-resolution mass spectrometry-based methods to understand the impact of uh, exposures. We're looking at lifestyle-related exposures, in this case, uh, electronic cigarette exposure in humans. So electronic cigarettes, or e-cigs, are um, electronic nicotine delivery systems, or ENDs, that are being used as alternative to uh, conventional tobacco cigarettes. It is perceived as safe devices, because uh, as a safe alternative, I mean, because they, uh, there's no combustion process and they emit fewer carcinogens. However, uh, the long-term health effects of these devices uh, in humans are unknown. So yesterday, we presented our work on understanding the potential health effects of uh, electronic cigarettes in humans. Um, there are two questions that we're trying to address uh, in this uh, study. So the first one, what are the carbonyl compounds that are generated in and present in saliva of e users uh, after vaping? And the second question is, what uh, are the potential uh, damage they can cause to the DNA in the oral cell cavity of these uh, e users? So to address these questions, we have recruited five uh, e-cigarette users. Uh, we invited them to the clinic. Uh, we took uh, pre-exposure or before uh, vaping saliva samples. And then they vaped for 15 minutes, as they normally do, using their own devices, using their own e-liquids. And then after 15 minutes, we took their post-exposure saliva or after uh, vaping uh, saliva samples. At the same time, we also took uh, some oral cells from the mouth rinse of these e cigarette users to isolate the DNA for us to, uh, to determine whether uh, we can um, identify some DNA uh, damage in the form of adducts. So these DNA adducts are covalent modifications in DNA that uh, if they persist, they can cause genetic changes and uh, mutations. If these mutations persist, they can eventually, or could lead to cancer. So, oh, go, ahead. go ahead. Sorry. Were you finished? <laughs> okay, Dr. Pablo, is there anything you'd like to add? Um, yeah, it's just uh, for us it was very exciting to be able to um, develop these methodologies to really characterize um, the effects and the exposure that comes from these products and the effects uh, in humans. So uh, what our findings are consistent with what other people have uh, already measured and seen by looking at the uh, characterization of the e-liquids that are used in these systems by looking at the vapors. Um, the importance of this study comes from the fact that our data come from people that are uh, recruited and are normal, regular vapors, and there is not a, um, a typical model setting where there is always a question on whether the exposure reflects really what is happening in real life. And so that is the part of the study that we're really um, interested in, and we're happy to have been able to show that our methods are allowing us to really characterize what's happening in, the, in a real case scenario. Very good. Are there any questions? Please state your name and affiliation before asking your question. Front row here. Hi there. You um, mentioned that these levels of these three DNA uh, damaging compounds increased. Oh, sorry, Rebecca Traeger with Chemistry World. Um, you mentioned that these uh, levels of the three DNA damaging compounds increased in the saliva of these study subjects after they vaped for 15 minutes. Can you give more information about what, what, how much they increased and comparatively? So uh, we previously published a method that will allow us to uh, look at uh, carbonyl compounds. So these carbonyl compounds are highly reactive, and they can actually interact with biological molecules in the oral cavity, such as DNA. 
So we found that um, acrolein, methyl glyoxal, and formaldehyde were increased after vaping. So, uh, for example, formaldehyde can react with DNA to form DNA addict, which uh, was found in uh, other studies like tobacco uh, smoking. So here we also seen um, some of these carbonyl compounds, but then our method also allow, allowed us to see uh, other unknown compounds that we don't know yet their identity. So right now we're trying to characterize all these potentially reactive compounds that are generated during vaping. But in particular, we saw that acrolein uh, is increased after you know, um, vaping. And then uh, we looked at the DNA addicts that were known to be caused by acrolein, and we've seen that to be increased as well in the oral cell DNA of these uh, ACG users compared to non-users or healthy controls. I, I was asking by how much did it increase? Mm -hmm. So for acrolein, um, so depending on the e-liquid that they used, and of course the devices, devices as well, uh, it can, uh, we found like 30 to 60 times higher after vaping. So this is fold changes. So we have the baseline before saliva, uh, bef uh, before vaping, and then after vaping, and then we'll just we just did the ratio uh, after over before and looked at the fold change. What about the other two compounds? How much did they increase in the saliva? So for methyl glyoxal, we all also seen like uh, 30 to 60 times higher, while for formaldehyde, we've seen like uh, double to like six times higher uh, increased after exposure. Um, I presume that those three compounds also increase um, for smokers, and I just wonder by how much, is it known by how much they increase for conventional smokers? That's a really good point, because uh, right now we're actually trying to compare uh, recruiting subjects too for conventional smokers and try to compare the, the levels of this uh, carbonyls or DNA addicts between regular smokers and e-cig users to have a good you know, like, um, picture of the differences in the levels. And you mentioned there are some novel carbonyl compounds as well. So are there the other things that could have um, DNA changing ca capability? Are there things that you, f you don't find in cigarette smoke? I mean, are, th are there potentially even more carcinogenic? It may be that there are less compounds in e-cigarettes, um, I suppose, but I, I, is there potential that there could be something that's even more carcinogenic? So that's one thing that we're also trying to um, look at, is to characterize everything that we could see or generate that during vaping. And uh, we only, right now, we have seen that there are actually several unknown carbonyls there that we don't know yet their identity and what are their potential impact on the DNA. But that's, uh, we're actively pursuing that um, right now. The comparison between cigarettes and e-cigarettes right now has really been focusing on the carcinogens that are present in regular cigarettes and then to see then how much or if they are present in e-cigarettes and sort of compare the safety of these new devices compared to the regular cigarettes. But the work that we did on look, really looking at the exposure that comes uh, that is present in saliva is something with our methodology is something that we haven't um, pursued in smokers yet and so definitely that is something that we have to do in order to compare whether these carbonyl compounds that we're measuring and seeing in the uh, saliva of e-cigarette users are present or in regular cigarette users as well but we don't know at the moment. And did you just use one type of e-cigarette um, in that study or was it several? No. So the beauty of this study, again, comes from the fact that the people that were recruited uh, were allowed to use their own device. Um, so um, Romel yesterday presented uh, really a summary of all the different types, and it was quite interesting and remarkable to see that among the five people that we recruited, there were just 
really all sorts of different uh, devices used, different uh, wattages and different uh, e-liquids and flavorings. And this was in a way reflected by um, really the diversity of carbonyl, of the profile of carbonyl compounds that Rommel has measured in the saliva. The interesting point was though that for all of them, some of these compounds were consistently elevated. And so that's why then we focus on those when looking at the DNA damage. Is it the case, I mean, just based on your expert, would you envisage that some e-cigarettes had more cancer causing potential than others? I mean, are there certain varieties that are safer than others? This goes to the core of the problem on looking at the safety and health uh, effects of e-cigarettes, which is the fact that we're considering e-cigarette as one type of product, and it's not. We have at least four different types of devices itself. And for each device, a recent study has reported around 7,000, more than 7,000 different type of flavors, so going from different brands and different combinations. In addition to this, you can also have e-cigarettes that are um, that can be um, um, customly prepared, so you can mix and match, and there's a lot of uh, um, literature also showing that you can add different things like more tobacco in it, or even marijuana or alcohol. So it really becomes extremely difficult to understand uh, the results of all the studies and all the research that has been done when then it comes down to understanding what is the actual product that we're looking at. And that's why we think that it's important to set up this type of methodologies that allow us to look not only at characterizing the product, but really at what happens in the saliva and at the target point. So what is that type of exposure? And then can we, at that point, understand what are the health effects that we are that we should be focusing on? Because the e-cigarettes itself is what we call the Wild West, really. Yeah, I, I wonder. I mean, in a sense, is, are there fewer regulations then over what you can add to e-cigarettes than for conventional cigarettes? Because mm -hmm. it seems like if you add different compounds together in this way, you could get a whole plethora of compounds and you don't know what they're going to do. Absolutely. So it may have less um, carcinogens, but um, I guess, you know... It, it may have, have less if well. we compare, again, if we compare the e-cigarettes to the regular cigarette um, tobacco burning cigarette, and if we focus on the carcinogens that are present in the regular cigarette and try to find them in the e-cigarette, then we can see, and it's, it's, I guess there is general consensus, that the carcinogens that are present in tobacco, regular cigarettes, are at lower levels or not present in e-cigarettes. But then when we consider e-cigarettes on their own, they are a completely different uh, different uh, scenario, they're a completely different reality. And so what we're trying to do is really try to have the methodologies to address the question on whether they are, if maybe safer, but if they are any, you know, if they're really safe or not. Do you plan to do any studies on second-hand vaping smokers? Because I, I understand that with cigarettes, it's, it's even more dangerous for non-smokers to inhale. I, th I think that in the future there will probably be uh, room for that, clearly, but at the moment right now we're lacking so much information on the actual effects of people that are using these devices that what our focus for now will be really on trying to understand a little bit better what using these um, type of products is, is um, meaning for public health. Thank you. And we have an online question from Sean O'Day, who's a researcher at RIT. And the question is, um, there are two main smoking behaviors, mouth to lung and direct to lung inhalation. Do you know what behavior was used for each participant and why did you focus on saliva? So each participant was allowed to use their device as they wanted. And so we didn't really restrict their uh, behavior in a different, in a specific way. So that's to answer the first question. And the second question is, we focused on saliva again because we can characterize what's in the e-liquids. We can characterize, and it has been done, we can characterize what's coming from the vaping and what's in the vapors again, and this has been done. 
But once these um, compounds are reaching uh, the oral cavity and are getting into uh, the, t the, con at the contact with the tissue and they're getting into the saliva, there is also um, oral uh, flora uh, metabolism that can occur. And so there can be different species that are generated. And so we really wanted to see what are the chemicals that are in contact, in direct contact uh, with the oral cavity. The reason for this is that uh, my lab has been focusing on the study of um, effects of alcohol in relation to head and neck cancer and esophageal cancer. And we have learned from those studies that people that drink have spikes of acetaldehyde, which is a carbonyl compound, in their oral cavity right after consumption of drinks of a drink because of the local oral um, microbiome and the local metabolism. And so because of this and because of our interest in what are the impact, what is the impact on the potential effects on the oral cavity, um, we focus on saliva as a surrogate tissue that could, a surrogate sample, sorry, that could allow us to understand really what is the exposure that may be of interest for the effects on the tissues um, at the first entry point, basically. Bela has a question. Uh, Bela Busleg, ACS. Um, e e cigarettes and, and normal tobacco based cigarettes and, uh, and are basically different in one particular respe uh, respect. Uh, from normal cigarettes, you'd get particulates, you get, you get tars and so forth, and ESIGs are supposed to be the ones uh, that prevent you all the, uh, from all that nasty stuff. They still pyrolyze compounds big time and so forth. What kind of a, a, a quantitative shift is there for, uh, for pyrolysis products, uh, which would be, I, I expect, the, the, the driving force for DNA modification? And, Having said that, uh, I, I expect more people to die of heart, heart attacks uh, because of, uh, of uninhibited use of, of, of nicotine from, from e than, uh, than regular tobacco. I'll go for this one. Um, so definitely um, the amounts of nicotine that are present in these devices is potentially a concern, especially when um, you're using customizable um, um, systems where you can just decide what to use and how to use it. And there is also a, a, um, a problem for people that are naive, that haven't been using nicotine before. And so the e-liquids are uh, present in different amounts and different levels of nicotine, but you decide what is the level that you want to you want to uh, try. So definitely, there is a, a potential for um, for intoxication in that sense. Um, the wattage and the heating temperature of the devices is also changing. So they have there are some devices that are at higher level that have a higher temperature, and so definitely in that case, the pyrolysis is going to take place at higher level compared to lower levels that instead are producing uh, less um, products from pyrolysis. Um, so again, it's a problem of defining what device is used and defining then the end point, which is what are the products that are, that are reaching the cellular target. And pyrolysis is a problem that leads to the fact that all the components in the uh, e-liquid are going to be transformed somehow. And so it's not just directly using what is known to be safe because the flavorings that are used are known or recognized to be safe for ingestion. But again, what happens when they are encountered, when they're going through pyrolysis and being transformed to other products, then we don't know. And so that's why we want to basically characterize what's happening downstream from that point. Uh, one one more question. Uh, you mentioned acrolein uh, as, as one of the bad actors. Well, acrolein, in my recollection, forms for essential glycerol-like fat, uh, uh, fats, and so uh, in, uh, it's, it's, it's essentially a pyrolysis product right there. If you eliminate any of the triglycerides or diglycerides from 
uh, from E6, would you be able to, to essentially drop that? Because it is a nasty actor. Mm -hmm. I guess that would be a possibility. I'm not familiar with the engineering of the devices, and, and obviously they chose a safe um, uh, vector or safe um, um, solution that is possible to use, which is propylene glycol or glycerin, uh, vegetable glycerin. So that's most of the, what is the the e liquid. Um, I guess there could be some modification there and some optimization in order to reduce uh, the uh, products um, and and the amounts of acrolein. Um, again, there is not much regulation, and so our hopefully our findings are going to inform uh, a better um, design or a better um, regulation of these products and and potentially make these devices even safer. Maybe maybe your finding will uh, convince people stop uh, stop even e cigs rather than than you know pyrolyzing the world and, 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 and because they're not the only ones that, that are getting the, uh, their kicks. It's all everybody around them. Yeah. Rebecca Traeger with Chemistry World again. Um, can you tell me, um, sorry, I've just completely blanked out. Um, can you tell me um, two things? One, was nicotine in each of these devices, I know you didn't control sort of what they used, but were they all, do they all have nicotine? And second of all, can you tell me more about the um, larger study that you have planned and sort of what you'll be looking at? I mean, five people isn't a huge number, so. So for the first question, if there's nicotine in the e-liquid, so uh, all the five e users that we recruited, uh, there's, there is nicotine in their e-liquid as based on the, you know, like the composition. And um, for the second question, yes, we definitely need to recruit more subjects, and that's what we are currently uh, recruiting ESIG uh, vapors right now to uh, make sure that uh, we can get more data on this um, pilot study. How many people would you need for that larger study to make it sort of more robust? I think the more the better. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're aiming at at least 100. Just the last question, really, was to, uh, did you see any variability in the amount of acrolein and the amount of DNA damage in, among the five individuals that you had? Because you know, they were all using different products. So mm -hmm. I wonder whether how much variability you saw among them. Actually, we did. So in the five subjects that we uh, looked at the DNA addict of acrolein, so one of them has uh, not um, showed no significant increase, but uh, we also have to take note that each of us have the capacity to repair this DNA damage. So depending on how you, uh, how your um, repair mechanisms work will also dictate the amount of this DNA addicts in the oral cavity. So overall, there was a large variability both in the addicts and in the levels of um, acrolein measured, but um, all these five, for all five subjects, the amount they've increased, the fall change was significantly higher than um, other uh, carbonyl compounds that we have looked at. And so that was consistent. Um, so that is the part that is striking even more so because it was only five subjects and they were all um, using different products and, and smoking in different ways and or vaping so in different ways and so um, that's I just wondered sort of if the variability might have come more from the fact that they were using different products or perhaps from the fact that they were different ages or different health status and uh, right we tried to make sure that they were uh, all um, pretty much within a specific range of age, and uh, we try to make sure that they don't have other health concern, any other, any health concern or under any medication. So we're trying to control as much as possible those variables. Mm -hmm. But the variables that come from uh, the actual um, device itself and, and the way that they, uh, they uh, use the product, um, that was not controlled, and so on. Thank you. Any other questions? All right, thank you. The archived version of this session will soon be posted at bit.ly backslash ACS Live underscore Boston 2018. Please join us for our next press conference at 1 p.m. today on a portable
freshwater harvesting.